Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is based um, very heavily on something we published earlier this week, actually, um, which we publish every year. We call it the IFS Green Budget. It's green in the sense of a green paper rather than green in the sense of environmental. Uh, it's something the IFS has been doing for more than 30 years now. And the idea of it is it sets out clearly, independently and objectively the sets of options facing the Chancellor in the budget, which this year will be on March the 19th, um, and in particular sets out uh, very clearly and independently and objectively where the public finances are at. So what I'm going to talk to you about today largely will be about the public finances. I'll say a little bit if I have time at the end also about this big debate about what's happening uh, to, um, to household incomes. Now obviously the, what's been happening to the public finances it has been one of the biggest economic and political issues um, over the past, um, well, six years really, since, uh, since the recession hit uh, in 2008. And what I'm going to try and do is give you some sense of where we are, how we got there, and where we might be going. But let me um, start, because I think you know, the important background of all of this really is what's been happening um, to, to, to national income. Let me, let me start with, not the first chart I had there, but with this one. This is... Um, in, in red, um, what we thought a year ago uh, was happening to growth, and in blue, uh, what we think now uh, is happening or has been happening to growth. Well, one thing that you'll see here, I think this is a theme of a lot of work in this area, is that last year we didn't even know what was happening four years ago, let alone uh, what might happen into the future. I'm not going to do very much about predicting into the future, since as you'll see from this chart, we don't even know what happened four years ago, let alone what's going to happen in four years' time. So the red lines are um, the uh, ONS figures. These are not you know, anyone else's estimates. These are the Office of National Statistics view about what happened to GDP in each of those years. And the Office of National Statistics thought that national income fell by 4% um, in 2009 last year. They now think it fell by over 5%. And you'll see that there have been other revisions um, over this period. The red bars um, were uh, a forecast a year ago for growth in 2013, uh, right, right at the end. Uh, actually, of course, growth has been significantly better uh, than expected through 2013. So, so the background to the public finance story is this really terrible set of growth figures all the way up to 2012 and a bit of recovery um, in 2013. Now, where's that going into the future? Um, well, we will still have, uh, we still have national output GDP, as I'm sure you know, below where it was in uh, 2008 before the recession hit um, and in terms of where we are relative to trend we've lost about 15% uh, of national income so the economy is more than 200 billion pounds smaller uh, than we would have expected back in 2007 and there lies the problem with the public finances because of course it takes a long time to adjust spending to that so where are we in terms of the government's fiscal consolidation plans well what this chart is showing you is the scale of consolidation, that's uh, tax increases and spending cuts, introduced by um, each of those years. So the current government is saying it wants to introduce a fiscal consolidation of the scale you see right at the end in 2018-19. There are about 10% of national income. Now, I'm probably going to say words like unprecedented and historically unique several times through this talk, and that really is quite a staggeringly huge scale of fiscal consolidation. We haven't come even in the same ballpark in terms of spending cuts, certainly since the last war in terms of the scale of change required here. Now that's perhaps not surprising because we haven't had a recession of this scale since at least the 1920s. So that's the scale, that's what people are talking about when they talk about the scale of uh, cuts and austerity that we're facing. Now two things that you can, or two additional things you can take from that, the blue bits of these bars are tax increases. That's what's being planned in terms of tax increases, the contribution of tax increases to the fiscal consolidation. And what you can see there is uh, that by the end of the period, it's a fairly small chunk of the total. It's less than 20%, considerably less than 20% of the total. And secondly, nearly all of the tax increases that have been planned have actually happened, and indeed they happened in the first year or two. Now, the various shades of red and pink are different kinds of of public spending, uh, benefits, um, investment spending, other current uh, 
spending. So the second thing you can take from this is that the majority of public spending cuts planned by this government have not yet happened. We're, we're less than halfway there. And in terms of um, other current spending, so that's essentially what you might think of as day-to-day -day spending on defence and education and environment and police and so on, we're only about 40% of the way there if, and I'll come to this in a moment, if the scale of these uh, cuts actually, uh, actually occur. So the total tightening, about 10% of national income, as I said, we're about um, 46% um, of the way there in total, if what this government says uh, actually turns out to happen. Now, in the context of growth, um, the additional growth that we had last year has not helped in terms of what this government wants to do in terms of uh, fiscal tightening because the judgment of the OBR and most other uh, commentators is that that growth didn't change the long-run trajectory uh, of the economy compared with what was thought. So let's take this um, over a, a slightly longer time scale. The red line here is spending, the blue line here is tax, and on the um, vertical axis you've got uh, proportion of national income. So what you'll see, what happened uh, in the recession, spending whizzed up to about 48% of national income. Why? Well, national income took a dive, spending continued, continued to grow as planned in the 2007 spending review. What does all of that pain that I've just shown you, all of that fiscal um, austerity, all of those spending cuts, what does that get you? Well, that gets you spending as a proportion of national income basically back where it was in about 2004. So why, other than political preference, why might you think the government is doing all of so much of this on spending um, and so little of it on tax? Well, even after all that, even if they can put all of that in place, you get back to spending as a proportion of national income, roughly where it was in 2004, and actually tax as a proportion of national income, that's very slightly higher than at any other point um, on that chart. So we have all of this difficulty to get us back to that um, to get us back to that uh, position, and a surplus for the first time since uh, since 2001. Um, that's the the pale lines are well. Suppose we hadn't done anything. Suppose, uh, and this is not a plausible counterfactual, but suppose nothing had happened, no additional tightening was put in place. Well, by 2018, we would still be running uh, a deficit of about eight percent of uh, national uh, national income. Uh, which it, or even 10% of national income, which is, of course, entirely uh, impossible over the longer run, and uh, debt would have run massively out of control. Um, so what, are we, what, about, what about debt? Um, so this is, uh, this is the outstanding level of debt as a proportion of national income since 1996. You'll see that uh, it spent a little while below 40% of national income. That was the target set by the last Labour government. It said we will not run... Uh, we won't have debt more than 40% of national income. As with all fiscal rules, that was obviously torn, torn up when the recession hit. Uh, debt is now knocking on for 80% of um, national income. And even on those incredibly tight plans that I've just described, um, it's still at over 75% of national income by the time we get to 2018-19. Um, now, um, what that does get you on is a trend towards... Uh, or, or, you know, path towards zero if, if um, tax and spending as a proportion of national income remain at those levels um, going forward. Now, that's not a projection. That's just an illustration. Um, in the longer run, actually, things don't look so great because once you take into account the effect of population aging, even on this incredibly tight and optimistic set of assumptions, you still don't get anywhere near that. You kind of stabilize at about 30% and then start rising um, in the long run. But the key thing is even on these as I say, very, very tight assumptions. You don't get back to that 40% level until the early 2030. So it will be um, more than 20 years, 25 years, on the tightest possible assumptions before national debt gets back to the kind of levels it was before, uh, before the recession hit. But again, as I say, don't take that as a projection. That is, a, that, that is, that, that is the most positive possible illustration of, um, of where we might be going. So there's been an awful lot of... Um, stuff in the newspapers about, you know, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the opposition's view of what it might be doing. Um, so uh, the government, Mr. Osborne, has said, well, what I want to do is get, um, is, is actually run a surplus by 2018-19. Uh, Mr. Balls has said, um, 
that the uh, next Labour government will run a surplus on the current um, budget, um, which is not the same, because the current budget is the amount, it depends only on the amount that's spent on day-to-day -day spending, essentially it leaves him an, as much manoeuvre as he wants, really, on how much to spend on investment um, spending. So we reckon that that uh, could allow, um, under that, that fiscal rule, um, about an extra £26 billion of spending a year by 2018-19. Now, there's two points here. That what, what the government is suggesting, I think, runs some really big risks in terms of just the sheer scale of spending cuts that will be required to meet that. I think what the opposition is suggesting um, runs uh, at least some risk with the scale of the particularly debt that that leaves um, at the end of it. The current budget surplus is much less constraining than a, an overall budget surplus, and I think the trade-off is between the benefits of higher spending and lower tax and the cost of debt falling less rapidly. Now that ought to be, that is actually a perfectly sensible state for the parties to be arguing with each other about come the next election. At what speed do we want to do this? And I think, don't, don't think either, um, n neither of those positions is in any sense daft. It's a perfectly sensible trade-off um, to argue about. Uh, whether we will have a sensible debate about that, I am somewhat in more doubt. Um, so, what about um, those risks? So, supposing, and now I, I'm, I'm supposing that uh, the current government carries on with its plans, what are, what are the risks that are associated with that? Um, well, there's obviously risks around um, what happens to the uh, economy. We don't know. Um, well, one of the big things is we don't actually even know how big a consolidation um, is actually required. So if the output gap at the moment is very large, then the amount of additional long-run uh, consolidation required is really not very big because the economy will move back towards um, its, uh, its long-run um, uh, equilibrium and all will be fine, actually with very little in the way of additional um, spending cuts. So the figures that I showed you assume that there is actually only rather a small output gap at the moment, about 1.5% of national income. Now, some forecasters are rather more pessimistic about that. Um, some believe that the output gap is zero at the moment, in which case you would need more of a consolidation than, uh, than is currently required. Some are much more optimistic. Some actually think that the output gap is even 5 or 6% of national income. And if that were true, you wouldn't actually need any more consolidation in the long run uh, to get you back to uh, fiscal uh, balance. It matters, of course, because if the, um, if the borrowing is purely cyclical, so if there's a big output gap that implies that the borrowing is cyclical, uh, then uh, it will disappear when the economy returns to uh, potential. But if there's not much of an output gap, then the borrowing is structural, and the only way of getting rid of it is actually to um, indulge in the kind of fiscal consolidation that I've just, uh, just described. And as I say, there is just a huge amount of uncertainty about where that is. Um, so if the output gap is larger than the OPR, OBR forecasts, then the economy is further below trend, more of the borrowing is cyclical, more of the borrowing, would, borrowing will disappear automatically, and so a smaller consolidation is required. The trouble is nobody knows the scale of this output gap. And actually the way that this government has written its fiscal rules actually depends on your estimate of the size of that output gap. And that's a very difficult thing to target because it's not something you can measure Directly, and I'm not going to talk about how uh, how you measure this because it's uh, that, that's the subject of an entirely different um, lecture. But here we are. That's um, uh, if the OBR is right, if the budget responsibility is right. There's a 1.8% output gap. Then to get the public finances essentially back to where they were pre-recession, you need an 8.5% of national income consolidation. If the most pessimistic forecasters are right, and there are some forecasters out there who say we, we are at trend now. Uh, then you need near enough a 10% um, uh, consolidation. But if the most optimistic are right, then you only need a 5.5% of national income consolidation. Actually, if the most optimistic guys are right, we pretty much don't, want to do, don't need to do anything else. Um, but if the most pessimistic ones are right, then what the government currently has planned will be enough. You will need all of that 10% uh, tightening. So that's a big, uh, a, you know, a big uncertainty, and, and we won't know, frankly, until several years after it happens. So let me move on from that macro issue to, to the taxes and then um, the benefits. So 
obviously, how, how are we going to do on the public finances depends on how much tax we get in and how much we spend. Um, now, as the economy grows, you'd expect tax receipts to grow. Um, current forecasts are that there will be significant increases in the amount we get from income tax and capital taxes over the next several years. Capital taxes meaning capital gains tax, inheritance tax, and um, stamp duties may or may not be um, too optimistic. One of the things that's ra rather interesting to look at is how has, the, uh, how has the composition of tax revenues changed over time? And there's two things, or several things, to take from this chart. First, we've become more and more dependent on the three big taxes. Now, people, you, you will continually hear politicians talk about this tax and that tax and you know, how they're going to sort out the um, uh, public finances by fiddling around with one tax or another. There really are only three taxes that count for the public finances nowadays. That's income tax, national insurance contribution, and VAT. Between them, they um, account for, I can't add that up in my head, but about two-thirds of, um, two of total tax revenue. So if you want to do anything really substantial with taxes, you're probably going to do something with income tax, national insurance contributions, um, or VAT. You'll see the other one that's risen over time is capital taxes, which I just mentioned, the stamp duties and um, and, and, and so on. So we're becoming more um, uh, dependent on those particular forms of um, taxes. So at the moment, or looking forward, we have the highest proportion of taxes from um, uh, direct taxes, VAT and NICS, since at least 1978. I think the other thing to bear in mind about the income taxes is that we're becoming more and more dependent on a very, very small number of people to pay all of those income taxes. <laughs> So the top 1% of income taxpayers pay about 27.5% of income tax in 2011-12, um, which is a, you know, a, remarkably, uh, a remarkably large amount. It's more than two and a half times um, the amount that the top 1% paid back in, um, back in 1979. Now, that, of course, is because they are so staggeringly rich. They've got vast amounts of money. The top 1% are essentially the people with incomes over 150,000. Actually, the top 0.1% with incomes over a million uh, are themselves responsible for quite a large proportion um, of that total. So that, at least in some sense, you might, might worry you about kind of quite how much uh, we're dependent on that very small um, group of individuals. If you look at stamp duty, as you probably know, when you buy a house, you have to pay stamp duty. About a third of that is paid uh, by the, for the 1% of properties which cost more than um, a million pounds. So again... Um, a very large proportion coming from a small number um, of people. So that's one set side of the um, one side of the story. The other side of the story is, of course, the spending cuts. Now, I've already said that actually nearly everything about this change in the public, this 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 period of austerity, is about what's happening on the spending side. Very little of it is about what's happening on the tax side. So, what is happening to spending? Now, I showed you um, how spending was falling very sharply, or was planned to fall very sharply as a proportion of national income. Actually, it probably surprised you to know, given what I've just been saying, I'm talking about the kind of the most staggeringly difficult set of spending cuts in history, um, when I show you that line. Um, that's total spending in real terms, so just price adjusted um, over this period. And essentially, it's flat since 2008, uh, down about 3.8% over, over an eight-year period. Now, that doesn't, look very, that doesn't look very scary. I mean, that uh, um, it's obviously comes after a long period of increase. So how, 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 how can that be? Well, first of all, that is consistent, of course, with spending falling as a proportion of national income, assuming that national income actually rises um, over that period. But that's total spending. What about the components of spending? Well, that's debt interest. Well, there's a lot more debt out there, so a lot more debt interest to be paid. So that's rising by nearly 50% over this period, and that's um, uh, with some fairly you know, conservative assumptions about what interest we're going to have to pay on that debt. So an extra $22 billion of spending on, on debt interest. Now, that's not much use to anybody, in a sense. Um, so that obviously means that other spending is falling. So over the period, non-debt interest spending is falling by 7.5%. Now, that sounds tough, but that's, uh, you know, that doesn't sound quite as dramatic as I was making out. So how's that non-debt interest spending? Um, let's... Just look at the non-debt interest spending amount. Why, what's happening within the components of that? Again, there are parts of it which are rising fairly steadily over this period. Spending on Social Security benefits is due to rise by about 17 billion over this period. Now, this is before 
any assumption about whether the government manages to achieve additional cuts to those that is already planned and put into place. It has put significant cuts in place. It's talking about another 12 billion of cuts, but hasn't told us anything about what those might look like. So that's what social security spending uh, looks like. Why is that? Well, mostly because pensioner benefits are rising. Why is that? Because an awful lot more pensioners over this period, two million additional pensioners over um, this period, with the result that public service spending, that's spending on defence and education and environment and home office and so on, is falling by about 14% over this period. Uh, within that, uh, the bits that the department spends going down by 20%, now that's really huge. Why is that different? Well, part of what's in public service spending is actually public service pensions, payments to the European Union, and other bits and pieces that we can't control, which don't actually kind of help public services. So a 20% fall over this period in public service spending. Now, that really is uh, pretty dramatic. And I won't go through the rest of that. My red light has come on, so I'll finish this fairly quickly. Now, the departmental spending targets may, of course, be difficult um, to achieve. These really are very uh, tough. Let me explain two reasons why um, this might be particularly um, difficult. Well, a 20% real cut in public service spending, which is a cut of a third in the bits that aren't protected. So that's, you protect health and you protect schools. Everything else, the police, environment, defence, so on, has to go down by a third. Will that, um, will that happen? Well, I don't know whether that will happen or how hard that will be. It certainly be extremely hard. And actually, the two things that are causing that to be even harder, one is the population is actually rising really rather fast over this period. Um, ONS reckons it will rise by 3.5 million over the period that I'm talking about. So um, average spending is falling by 1.7% a year, but spending per person is falling by 2.4% a year. And even, with, um, even within that, a lot of that's to do with high increase in the older population. That's why pension spending is going up. So uh, given that we spend so much of health spending on the old elderly part of the population, um, whilst the government said it's going to protect in real terms the amount we spend on the NHS, the amount per person, once you adjust for the age structure of the population, is actually falling by 9% over this period. So these are really much tighter even than they look. The result is that this thing that we call public service spending will be at its lowest level since 1948 by the end of this period, actually very similar to where it was at the end of the 1990s. So the uh, thing to take away from this, I think, is this is going to be a very, very tough period. Four years through a nine-year fiscal consolidation. Um, we're less than halfway through the tightening. Um, if the rest is implemented, then government will be running a surplus in 2018-19, but there are really big risks in this, particularly on the spending side. Now, I've got some more on incomes, but I think I'd better stop there because that red light's been shining for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Johnson for an engaging speech. Now, I want to take questions up until 2 o'clock, so quickly, um, if we could get some questions. There's a guy up here. And I'll quickly pass it down to him. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is to national insurance and income tax. Why don't we simply combine the two? What's the arguments against that? Wouldn't it be more efficient to simply amalgamate the two taxes rather than to collect them separately? Uh, yes, it would, um, and there is no good reason that I can think of uh, for not putting them together other than political reasons. Um, people seem to be willing to accept increases in national insurance contributions in a way that they're not willing to accept increases in income tax, despite the fact these things are just taxes on income. There is now no relationship between what you pay in national insurance contributions and anything you get out of the welfare state. With the introduction from 2017 of a single-tier flat-rate state pension, essentially everyone, it will be a citizen's pension, unrelated effectively to national insurance contributions paid. National insurance contributions and income tax should be amalgamated. Just one example of um, the, the, the absurdity of the deba debate here is that you're probably aware the government is spending £10 billion a year, increasing the point at which you start to pay income tax to £10,000. That's costing them, in this period of incredible austerity, £10 billion a year. It is not the most sensible way of doing what they say they want to do, which is help low-income workers by reducing income taxes. If you want to do that, you should reduce the point, increase the point at which you pay, start to pay national insurance contributions, which is stuck at £8,000 a year. There's no rationality in it. So the answer to your question is, yes, of course you should. Um, it, it's just political nonsense that stops it happening.
Thank you very much for an informative speech. Um, what sense does it make for a government to make plans on budget beyond its term limit? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's... Uh, um, uh, so to, I think by making plans beyond its term limit, two, two, two things have happened here. The first is that there were a set of plans that this government came in, came in with or, or set out in 2010, which had the economy developed as they then hoped, would have got them effectively to cyclically adjusted balance by 2015, by the time of the election. So their initial plan was, let's sort all this out in this one parliament. Now the economy then went horribly wrong, um, it, or you know, it, wrong in, it did, didn't grow in the way that they'd expected at the time. The result of that was that borrowing went up relative to plans very dramatically. So we'll be borrowing about 110 billion this year. According to the plan set out in 2010, we should only be borrowing 50 or 60 billion. So we're borrowing an awful lot more than was planned. So what's happened? Well, the Chancellor has said, not, well, let's keep to the borrowing plans and therefore cut even bigger and faster. He's actually been very Keynesian. He said, well, you know, we've, we've had our plans, but the economy's gone worse, so we'll be flexible. We won't, we won't change the amount we're going to cut. We'll just accept a much higher level of, of borrowing. But what we're going to do is plan for those cuts later on after the next election. And that way, they said, well, we're keeping to our fiscal rules, which is um, to move to balance um, five years hence. So, so that's the, the reason for it. And I think actually the Chancellor has been much more Keynesian than people uh, usually sort of understand him to have been. The difficulty, of course, and the reason why he said in 2010 that his plans are more credible than the opposition's plans is once you make plans beyond the next election, well, who knows who's going to win the next election? And of course, you know, it may well be, uh, uh, it may well be the Labour Party, the opposition, and then they'll set their own different set of um, fiscal plans. So I think the, the, the fact of the election clearly adds a, a significant element of uncertainty into, uh, in, 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 into all of this. Thank you. Um, I can take two final questions. So, any, Thank you. Um, so it seems to me like uh, think tanks such as the IFS are becoming far more political in that politicians seem to be uh, like citing you to back up their arguments more and more. Um, is that a trend that you've seen happening? Is it something that you're happy with? To what extent do you tend to get involved in, in the day-to-day -day, uh, political debates? That's a good question. Um, I mean, we try, I mean, our whole... Um our whole raison d'etre is to be non-party political, and we're incredibly careful about um, being uh, independent and objective and not associated with, uh, with one side or the other. And actually, partly because of that, each party is always rather keen to quote us in their support and rather unkeen when we say things that they don't like. Um, actually, over the last couple of weeks, um, I've had to write um, three letters of complaint um, which I've only had to write three of in the last three years. So the, um, the, the, the Telegraph last week and the Times the week before, I've had to write and complain to them because they misrepresented, um, really quite badly misrepresented uh, things that we've said and actually behaved really very badly. Now, um, on the whole, um, because we have, I think, built up a reputation over quite a long time, the press treat us reasonably well. Uh, but I think because we are moving towards an election, uh, we're moving into more difficult, uh, more difficult political times. So it's, it's, I think, one of my biggest challenges over the next year um, is going to be keeping, you know, steering that very careful course um, between the sort of, um, you know, the political rocks on either side, um, between wanting to get out there and say, well, this is how it is, you know, this is why, you know, what, what's happening on income tax should be different because you should be taking account of national insurance contributions, for example, or why what's being planned on spending is incredibly difficult, or why what the Labour Party is saying is actually significantly looser fiscal policy than what the Conservative Party is saying. We have to be out there and say that because that's what we're there for. But we have to be careful to say it in a way which doesn't, um, or as much as we can control it, doesn't involve anyone saying, well, that shows that you're, you know, a right-wing think tank or a left-wing think tank or whatever. Now, um, we, we, we continue to get, um, you know, criticism from both sides, which is uh, reassuring. Um, but I have to, uh, you know, that, it's a very good question because it is one of the most difficult things that we do and I think going to be particularly difficult over the next year.